Father, we come to you and just give you thanks and praise that uh, you have given us this day to study and gather together and, and Lord, just set our hearts before you. I pray, Father, that, Lord, that you would <clears throat> help us to understand the significance of the things that we're about to study. And, Lord, I pray that uh, you would use it to bring understanding and enlightenment to those who are struggling with the truth and realities of your word and that the, the clarity of your word would be evident to them on the doctrine of Christ, Lord. And I pray that, Lord, that you would uh, just bring them uh, to the truth that they may receive the knowledge of Jesus Christ in fullness, Lord, and, and walk in your blessing, Lord. And I pray, Father, that uh, for those who are not saved, that this would be an, an opening to them to understand exactly what you accomplished in Christ and uh, in the sense of the incarnation and that, Father, they would move on from there to understand the, the death and resurrection of Christ and their, and their salvation that's tied to that, Father. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just for refresher's sake, we have uh, been asking the question, who do you say that I am? And we we're on part two, the answer. In part one, the question, we noticed that uh, uh, this is the question that Jesus asked uh, of Peter in Matthew 16, 15. But who do you say that I am in regards to who do the people say that I am? And then, well, who do you say that I am? And so it's an important question. In fact, it fits, the, as we mentioned before, the two questions of the, the Bible in each testament. First of all, the, in the Old Testament, who is God? And in the New Testament, who is Jesus? And so part two today, we're doing the answer. And, um, and we mentioned before that the answer given by historic Christian theology is, is basically codified in um, the ecumenical councils and creeds uh, consisting of the Council of Nicaea, Council of Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon. Uh, these are some early councils that basically addressed the doctrine of Christ and established the historic Christian faith um, in a creed. Uh, specifically the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us in our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. And that basically sums up the Christology of the Nicene Creed. There's more to it, but we're not getting into that. So that defines the historic Christian faith as represented in all the major denominations, even ones you never heard of, like the, the Eastern Church, the Syrian, uh, whatever, I don't forgot the, what the names of them are, uh, but the Coptics over in Egypt. Now, some of them have some, some Christological issues when you get past Nicaea, um, but on, on the essential element that Jesus is God incarnate, his, uh, the historic Christian position is uh, defined in the Nicene Creed. It's not authoritative for us but it is informative for us as to what the church believe and it's consistent with the fact that uh, as jesus said when the spirit of truth has come john 16 13 that he will guide you into all truth so it's it's consistent with that idea that that all christianity would be consistent uh, in unit and in unity on this issue they diverge on everything else but on this issue there is uh, consistency and unity now we said that the last time the first objection is that the church deified Jesus at this council. Well, uh, you know they they just uh, suppressed everybody else and 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 basically used politics to put down the opposition. And so the church deified Jesus. 
and declared him to be God despite disagreements among other Christians at the time. And, you know, we said that's basically not really accurate because there was a lot of back and forth. And in fact, politics was used <laughs> against the Nicene position. But more important is than the historical record of the church is what did the apostles teach? And that's what we looked at last time. Uh, we began to look at what, what, did they, what did they believe? And we saw that Peter uh, refers to Jesus as our God and Savior in 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. And this is parallel to his statement about Jesus in 2 Peter 1 11. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. And so those are in the Greek are very parallel. And obviously in 111, it's about Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So in, in uh, the previous verse, is is our God and Savior. Basically, Peter is saying that Jesus is God. Now, I recognize that there are those who push back upon the Greek on that. And uh, so while that is not a slam dunk absolute, and in, you know, when you're translating from from Greek and Hebrew over in English, almost nothing is an absolute slam dunk. But uh, these are strong arguments that can give us confidence when compared to the rest of Scripture. So uh, what about Paul? Paul had uh, similar language. We didn't cover this one last time, and so I want to cover it just a little bit tonight. Romans chapter 9, verses 3 through 5 says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Well, that seems pretty clear cut in English, and honestly, I think it's fairly clear cut in the Greek. Um, it, there's, there are alternative ways of understanding it. You could say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christ who is over all, and then a blessed, you know, a blessed be God forever type thing, like a, a doxology at the end about God, rather than making this a statement about Christ. It just seems out of place for Paul to suddenly just launch into this doxology. This, this praise of God, when what did he just say? You know, I wish I, I, for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to who pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. Oh, bless God that I could be, you know, wish myself a curse because they are. <laughs> you know, they're cursed from Christ because they've rejected him. I, I, it just doesn't make sense to, that that's all of a sudden a blessing towards God. It makes more sense that the Greek is actually referring to Christ. Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. So it seems to be a clear statement of the deity of Christ. So we continue on. Uh, we also talked about Titus 2.11 where Paul says, uh, uh, refers to, the, the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, people can push back, but the, I think the stronger argument and the context and all of that, to me, the weight is on uh, understanding that as a reference to Jesus as God and Savior. Now, we also talked about Paul's statement in Philippians 2, 5-11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, <coughs> and being found in appearance as a man. Uh, well, let's, let's stop there for a second. Uh, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now, we mentioned uh, the last time the contrast between form of God and form of bondservant. In other words, the idea there is that this is pointing to uh, the, the transition from equality with God to no reputation. So he, he, he didn't hold on to or grasp 
and, and cling to his equality with God, but was willing to be made of no reputation. So it's a transition from this exalted state down into a, an unexalted state. He became not just a form of a bondservant, but he became a bondservant. He, he became a servant to us. And so uh, he's, he's moving and transitioning from one to the other. So there's a great contrast there. And I think that points back to form of God, uh, really indicating his essential nature or, or essence as God, uh, his identity with God. Uh, again, we went into that more last time, and, and so I don't want to take a lot of time on that tonight, but uh, stinks to be those who won't see that. But anyways, um, so either Jesus considered himself equal with God and didn't want to take away from God, as the New King James kind of seems to indicate, that he didn't think it was taking away anything from God for him to be equal with God, or probably more likely that Jesus was willing to humble himself despite his exalted nature. Okay. Uh, oh, and one more thing about this passage, because we, let me back up, we continue on. Uh, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, Isaiah 45, 22 through 25 says this, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So, Right there, he's making it clear. There's one God. There are no other gods. Only him. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. And the Lord, all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and glorified. Now, I want you to think about that, that, that the, the point that, that I'm making is that if God is uh, alone as God and he, there is no other, for the New Testament writers, for Paul to use this quote, and remember Paul's a Pharisee, you know, he's a, 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 the strictest of the Pharisee, or the strictest of the sex is a Pharisee, and so he would not just willy-nilly ever use this kind of association because it, it makes a clear implication that Jesus is God, that, that he and, and the Father are one in the sense of actual essence because it's using this language. Not, Jesus isn't just, as one guy seems to think, just a, a, an agent of God. Uh, he is actually God, and, and you, when... When Paul ascribes this language to Christ, he is understanding what he's doing because he knows it would be blasphemy to do otherwise if Jesus wasn't God. So, this is where we pick up where we left off. All right, so tonight we begin with Colossians 2, 8 through 10. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now that seems pretty clear, doesn't it? I mean, that seems straightforward. How do you think someone would get around that? Come on in. How do you think someone would get around that? Um... And, and, and try to undermine the idea that, the, that Jesus has the fullness of divinity. The word in the Greek is, is, has, has, is you know, divinity. It's the only time it's used. Uh, divinity, deity, Godhead, you know. If they wanted to say, well, he wasn't really God, what is the, the way around it? Sure seems pretty straight, right? The fullness of the deity dwells in him. Well, the one guy that I, that I looked at that was uh, critiquing this was saying that, um, that 
it's the fullness of the revelation of God. And so Jesus isn't God in essence. He's just, he just fully reveals who God is. And so, you know, okay, well, maybe the fullness of the revelation of God is, is present bodily in Jesus. And, uh, but there's a problem with that. Uh, I mean, you think about it. If this is not his, his fullness of divine essence, but just the fullness of his revelation, well, what do we do with John 1.14? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we're going to get to that in a little bit about the word. But if you understand the word there to be, uh, you know, as John 1, 1 says, at God, then you understand that it's the essence or whatever the word is, whatever it, the word existed in this state and becomes flesh, it's not just the revelation, uh, uh, you know, just a revelation of God that becomes flesh. It's, it's, an, it's a thing, an entity, the word becoming flesh. And so we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I think that, that kind of puts it to this, this concept that there's more than just revelation here. There is, there is this, this entity that is a person who becomes flesh, and we'll see that here in a little bit, but I just want to kind of give you a heads up. But think about uh, Deuteronomy 4, 37. It says, And because God loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he brought you out of Egypt with his presence, with his mighty power. Now, how did God bring them out with his presence? What was the presence of the Lord? Yeah, we understood that to be the, the, the presence of God, right? And it ends up the tabernacle. And so God tabernacled with his people. And this is the same concept here that the word tabernacles or dwells with his people uh, in, in the flesh, dwells in, in, in the flesh. And so it's not just uh, uh, the fullness of the revelation. It's, it's the presence of God. And, and, and when we talk about the presence of God, and when you, you see that in Scripture, it says, you know, that the people were gathered in their presence, uh, or Saul gathered in his presence, in, in the presence of the people. In other words, they're really there. They're not just there in spirit or there in, in uh, revelation. They're literally there. So God was literally there with Israel as he led them out of Egypt. It was uh, in, the, in the glory cloud. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This isn't just the revelation of who God is. It's that's got, you know, where you're, you're full of joy. It's, it's in God's very presence. That's, that's pointing to the, the path of life is pointing to eternal life. So in the eternal state, in God's presence, presence there is fullness of joy there are, there, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So it's in the actual presence of God. So I, I think that, um, that we can understand that, that, that the, the John telling us in chapter 1, verse 14, that the, the word dwells in the, or became flesh and dwells among us. It's the presence of God. This is the real presence of God. This isn't just a, a manifestation of who God is like or what God is like. Okay, continuing on in the same uh, section of Scripture, Colossians 1.15, Paul says, He is the image, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And this is where we're going to get some fun tonight, but just want to hit, first of all, the image of the invisible God. Scripture does say that we are the image of God, right? But that's an interesting little phrase there that makes this a little bit more distinct. He is the image of the invisible God, not just the image of God. So he is the representation of God in a way that, you know, we can't see the invisible God, but Jesus becomes his image for us. He is the image of it. And so he is a manifestation of God, if you will. The, notice the second part of that, the firstborn over all creation. Now, at first glance, that might pose a problem, right? What does that make you think? Yeah, 
Well, he's a firstborn, but a firstborn, what does that mean, firstborn? Huh? Status? Status? Okay. Well, I mean, Uriah is my firstborn, but that's more than status. He had a beginning. Okay, and so it speaks to inheritance and, and all of that. Well, huh? Yeah, it, it's firstborn, but it becomes kind of a technical thing, you know, this, this, this concept of firstborn, especially in Scripture. It is a, it is a status that, that um, uh, you know, the firstborn gets the double portion and all that, and it's not just about the... Huh? Right, and you can steal the firstborn status. <laughs> <laughs> but listen to this Revelation 1 5 and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood so he's, in Paul he's the firstborn over all creation but in Revelation he's the firstborn from the dead but the, the interesting thing is the second part of that he and, Je and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So let's tie that in, how this works. Psalm 89 is the psalm about David's covenant, in, in which God makes a covenant with David. In verse 3 4, it says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So this is obviously about the Davidic covenant, Davidic throne. The David's seed, which we know will be Jesus, the Messiah. But it, down in verse 24, it says this. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. Talking about David's descendants, or descendant in, in particular. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. Also, I'll set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. Do you get the point I'm making there? That, that God is going to make this descendant of David his firstborn, i.e. make him the highest of the kings of the earth. So it is that status, it is that inheritance, and that is that place. Now how can he make him that if he's God? If Jesus is God incarnate, how does God make Jesus these things? How do, why didn't Jesus just have that status already? Well, yes, but Jesus didn't fall. But man did, okay. Ah. That's the key. When you ask a question about Jesus, you always have to do what? Ask two questions. Well, are we talking about his divine nature or his human nature? In his humanity, he has to be made firstborn. In his deity, he doesn't even have he doesn't he's not even you know, being talked about as the firstborn. It's his humanity that's being talked about as his firstborn. I was going to say, if you talk about the image of the invisible God, and then you say the firstborn over all creation, if you go back to the beginning of creation, he can't be born right. if he already was. Right. And, and we'll look at that here in, in, the, in the future, so, too. So it can't be talking about him, can it? I don't think so. And, and but people might like to make a lot of hay out of this. Well, he's the firstborn over creation. He must be created. First of all, that's not what the phrase is about. The, it's, it's, it's a technical term, if you will, pointing to his status, his inheritance, his place. Uh, and, and this is something that is obviously taking place in the life of Christ where he uh, comes and he humbles himself and then he is given a name above every name that every knee shall bow. So you see this, this transition from 
the, his place in heaven. He comes to earth. He's made like a servant. And then he's exalted again. Well, he was exalted as God in his deity. He is humbled in his humanity. His deity didn't get humbled. His humanity is humbled. He takes on the form of a bondservant. In other words, he humbles his, his person is humbled in that he's willing to take on this humanity. But he didn't give up his deity. His deity didn't get diminished in any way. So here he is, his humble servant, rejected and despised. And God's going to move him into the place of highest honor among all people, among all men. And, and so he is going to get the name that's above all names. And, and so he is moved in that place as a man. And, and, you know, one of the common things is how can Jesus be, you know, the mediator between God and man, you know, if he's, if he's both God and man? He can't be the mediator between God and men. It's the only way he could be the mediator between God and men is to be both. And so we have to talk about Jesus as both. Now, let's look at this again. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Notice that by him all things were created. So Paul is pointing here not just to the fact that he is the image of the invisible God, not just that he has the exalted name, but he's actually the means by which all things come into being. This is consistent with what John says in John 1, 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. This points to Jesus not just being the firstborn over creation as a created being, but the firstborn over creation in the sense that he's the creator of it. He's the source of it. He's, he's going to have the highest status, but he's also the one doing this. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 says, God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So Jesus, it, when, when God creates through Jesus, he doesn't create Jesus first. Because if all things that are created, that, that's a category mistake. If all things that are created are created through Jesus, he can't be created. Because he would have to exist in order to be the means by which he was created. And he can't exist before he's created. So it's a category mistake to think that Jesus was uh, created and then became the source of all created things. So, for by him all things were created. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So in him, he's before all things. So he exists before all things. He's the creator of all things in that he had to, you know, for everything is created by him. So anything that's created is created by him. He's before all that. And in him, all of that consists or holds together. So obviously, Jesus is not created. He's not a created being. He is the source of creation. Now, this would include the angelic realm because they're created. So he's not an angel, contra the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, through, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, and upholding all, the, uh, all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. So the one who is purging our sins and sits down at the right hand of the majesty is upholding all things by the word of his power. This is pointing to, clearly pointing to the deity of Christ, that Jesus is, is the sustainer of all things. Of course, he sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as in by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. Again, it goes back to the inheritance thing. It goes back to uh, that he becomes better in his humanity. 
He is exalted in his humanity above the angels. He lowered himself for a little while, but he becomes more exalted through his work. Colossians 1.17, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, and, and he is the head of... Uh, uh, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So it keeps pointing back to this exaltation who is, uh, of Christ. Our Colossians 1:19 uh, through 24, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. Again, going back to the, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now, I think it's pretty clear to, that Paul understood Jesus to be God incarnate. Uh, in Romans, it's almost certain that he called Jesus God. Uh, he, calls, he says that he is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. He, he is the, the, the image of the invisible God. He's the creator, or was the one who all things are created through. He's, he's uh, upholding or in, all things consist in him. Uh, and I think that personally that Paul wrote Hebrews. So all those Hebrew verses, uh, I think, were representative of Paul's belief in theology. That in him all things uh, are sustained by the word of his power. Or he sustains all things by the word of his power. So I think it's pretty clear that, that Paul believe that Jesus was God incarnate. I think it's pretty clear that Thomas believed that Jesus is God incarnate. Remember, Thomas is the doubter. And John 20, 26 says, And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Because uh, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now it's obvious. Thomas is answering him, Christ, my Lord and my God. Now, how do they get out of this? Well, some, some people uh, have speculated that Thomas falls down his, on his knees and says, My Lord and my God. And he looks away from Jesus and says to heaven, My God. No, this is, this is him worshiping Jesus, and Jesus receives that worship. Jesus does not rebuke him. In fact, we'll see another time. We'll look at this again. Um, well, he actually says here, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He didn't rebuke him. He received that. Now, I think a supporting verse that to me really just solidifies this is Psalm 35, 23, where it says, Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my God and my Lord. Reverse, but the same thing. My God and my Lord. Here is uh, Thomas, my Lord and my God. I mean, obviously, he is calling Jesus his God. There's no doubt about it. James. James says in James 1.1, 1, 1, uh, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now, I, I think it's interesting that he puts himself as a servant of both God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, this is not just a servant as in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a servant to everybody or, or that kind of thing. This is a servant in the sense that he is obedient to both and the commands of both, uh, of both having authority. And Jesus himself said, no one can serve two masters for he either will hate the one and love the other or else be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's not a real problem in, in our theology because God and Jesus are the same in the sense of their essence, not their person, but in the sense of their essence. And so those who reject that, though, and make this division between God and Jesus, that's, that's division of nature, have James being a bondservant to God and also to either an angel 
or a lesser god, some, some lesser created being, uh, some demigod. And, and so uh, how's that work, you know? If he's, if he's doing that and giving worship to the lesser being, he's in conflict with God right there. And he is not serving uh, the Father. Go ahead. Well, I, I think he may be. He may be. He, he, he probably is referring to the Father here, though. It's probably Father and Son more than did to humanity, which is fine. But if you, if you have a distinction, an, an essential distinction between the Father and the Son, then you, one is God and one is not. And I don't care how you exalt that, that being to maybe a, a, a lower God, a lower deity, or an angel or whatever, you still have God who says, there's no one like me, I will not share my glory with anyone, suddenly sharing his glory with a lesser being. And, 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 and so that becomes in conflict then with this, with this idea. You have, it becomes idolatry. So what are you saying? How do you reconcile this? Oh, I reconcile this uh, as just uh, uh, the fact that God is, yeah, that Jesus and, uh, is, you know, uh, God, that he is in essence divine. He is uh, in one in union with the Father, so there's no conflict for us because... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that. Okay. I don't, I, don't see, I don't understand why it needs to be reconciled because they, they are uh, they're one God. And, and so... They are. When I, when I read that, I read two separate entities. Uh, you're reading two separate persons, not two separate entities. If you read it uh, from a Nicene uh, perspective, if you read it from a Nicene perspective, there are two persons, the Father and the Son. And, and those two persons exist in one what? One uh, uh, God, one essence but when in, in the Godhead, there are three persons. Not just there's not just one God that's one person that has three different names. There are three persons, and we'll kind of when we get to the end of this thing, we'll do a little bit on the Trinity and explain the Trinity. Right now, we're just trying to get to this idea that Jesus, huh? Well, best you can. Right. Right. I get that, and, and and so let's continue on. I think that kind of develops some because for first century Christians, the there there and you'll see this in the text in just a minute. There is an overlap in identity. Sometimes you can't tell. Are they talking about uh, Christ? Are they talking about the Father? You can't hardly tell because there's this interweaving of the two. But at points where there are these greetings and all that kind of stuff, there are these, these clear, distinct uh, identities of the Father and the Son and it, it, as persons. And it would, you know, so this, this, this is drawn out, especially in the greetings uh, or in the, in the doxologies and those kind of things. But in just a second, we're going to see how James totally interweaves those two together. Um, it's, it's really cool. Um, <clears throat> Just to make the point that I'm making, uh, Revelation 22, 8 through 9 says, Now I, I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of God, uh, words of this book, worship God. So when someone is tempted to worship an angel, they are redirected not to do that, worship God. Only God. Didn't say worship God and the Son of God. Uh, it didn't say worship God and another being or lesser being. It's worship God. 
wor worship only goes to God. And so um, that was kind of my point there. James can't be serving both God and a lesser God. He has to worship only God, serve only God. And serve is a an aspect of worship. Now, James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. This is pretty interesting, the Lord of glory. Carm, which is the uh, uh, Christian Apologetics Research Ministry online, says, No one else in all of Scripture is referred to as the Lord of glory, but Jesus, and whenever the glory of the Lord is... Uh, and, where, and, when, uh, and whenever the glory of the Lord is is elsewhere spoken of, the Lord is always God. So Jesus is the only, only one referred to as the Lord of glory, and whenever you see the glory of the Lord, it's always God. So there's kind of a, a mix there, kind of a, a coming of the two together. Now, that is kind of clear as we look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. It says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So Jesus is the one being crucified. He is the Lord of glory. Uh, James is using that kind of language uh, of Jesus. And also 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 6 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not, do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So if he's the Lord of glory, uh, and he is the, the, the glory of God, he, in his face we see the glory of God, uh, and, is, and he is the, the uh, image of God. It's the gospel of his glory. All this points to the fact that Jesus is the one who is glorified. You know, it's, it's not just the, 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 that he has the glory of, of, of God. He is the Lord of glory. He and his person. And, and later on, when, when uh, we get to Jesus, we're going to see that Jesus claimed to have the same glory as God has. You know, uh, uh, restore to me the glory I had with you before the creation of the world. And, and so he is going to claim to have equality and glory with God. So he is the Lord of glory. Uh, Hebrews 1 again uh, says that... that uh, um, well, I'll just skip that one. Well, no, he is, he is uh, God spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also being, uh, he, he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So he's, he's, he's the Lord of glory. He's the, the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person. He is God present with us. He is the manifestation of God. But not just the manifestation of God, He is the Word become flesh. You put, you get all this stuff. You keep putting it all together into the mix. There's no way around it that Jesus, in His essence, in His nature, is uh, one with God in God's glory. He's not just, you know, Moses revealed God's glory on His face, and it faded away. But as we see later, we're going to see more and more. Jesus has this within Himself. We'll see it in John. He has life within himself. Uh, this isn't something that he possessed that God just kind of granted to him. This is something he has essentially. It is who he is. He is the Lord of glory. But not only is he the Lord of glory, he is also the judge. And this is where we begin to see that kind of that mixture I was talking about. James 5, 7 through 9. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for, co for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. 
Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Do you notice? Let's look at that again. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Who's that? I mean, when, when the New Testament talks about the coming of the Lord, we're talking the second coming of Jesus, you know, when, I, when, when he comes back. And so, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Well, who's the judge? James 4.12, there is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy but here are you to judge your neighbor. So who's the one lawgiver and, the, and, the, and judge? Well, it's Jesus uh, in, the, in, in the sense that when we get to it, but in this context, James is referring to the Father. He's referring to God. Because, huh? Oh, uh, yes. Well, not until after he got saved. <laughs> which he didn't believe at first. Uh, we don't have, we know there's a transition, uh, but, but uh, and I'm not even, I don't even remember now what, what the dates are, probable dates are for James' writing. But the thing about it is, uh, the point that I'm fixing to make here is that James is using this language. And, and honestly, you can't really tell. Because he doesn't say Jesus or Christ. He just says the Lord. So is he really, who's he talking about? Well, we know that he is saying there is only one lawgiver. He's talking about God. Isaiah 33, 22 says, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Lord here, you'll notice, is in caps. This is Yahweh. For Yahweh is our judge. What does Abraham say when, when he says, uh, when, when uh, 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 he wants to contend with God about going down and destroying uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? What's he say to God? Will not the judge of all the earth do right? So he identifies Yahweh, God, as judge. Here, James is clearly referring to God as judge. That there's only one lawgiver, one judge. But yet, when you read the first part of that passage, or, the, or, or later when he's talking about this, it actually, actually comes after chapter 4 and chapter 5, uh, the, the, you know, prepare for the Lord's coming, for the judge stands at the door. You know, if he doesn't say God or Jesus, you're just kind of vague, and it doesn't really matter because he's referring to both. They both fit the bill. In other words, there's this kind of weaving of the two back and forth, and and you see that a lot in New Testament. That that a lot of Old Testament terminology is applied to Jesus because he is God in the flesh, and it's appropriate to apply it to him. So it's appropriate to think that, that God is coming back and that he's the judge standing at the door. It's also appropriate to think that Jesus is coming back and that he's the judge standing at the door. In fact, Jesus said, all judgment is given into the hands of the Son. Paul says that, 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 that God will judge the world by one man whom he raised from the dead. Uh, you know, in Thessalonians, that Je Thessalonians, Jesus comes back in flaming vengeance, taking, uh, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. You know, so here he's the judge, and we're all going to sit before the, the judgment seat of Christ when, when the Son of Man comes to judge the nations. He's the judge. And so it doesn't matter when you're talking about the judge if it's a specific reference to the Father or if it's a specific reference to the Son, because while they are two persons, they are one essence, they are one God. Do you get what I'm getting at there? That, that sometimes you... you you know, they don't make specific clear references as, oh, this is about the Father or this is about the Son because it applies to both. And James seems to be doing that here. How about John? And uh, this is what we'll finish up with. And uh, it's pretty good stuff, pretty deep. Hopefully we can get through it quickly enough. I wanted to get to this tonight. 
What did John believe about Jesus? Well, John is the most clear about who he thinks Jesus is, and there's a reason for that. He wrote late, um, and so one of the objections is that John um, seems to show development about Jesus, that he, you know, all those things developed uh, and, and stuff. We'll, we'll have to answer that at some point. But let's look at what John believed. John 1, 1 through, 1 through 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. Now, if there's any verse in Scripture that clearly, absolutely clearly states that Jesus is God, it ain't this one. Because the word Jesus ain't in there. <laughs> However, it is clear that the word, uh, whoever the word is, is God. Now, you can prove that Jesus is the word by uh, a lot of other scripture, you know, they're both, there's a lot of language where the word is the one who by all things are created. Jesus is the one by whom all things are created. So there is an equivalency there. Uh, so proving that Jesus is the word isn't hard. But in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now I want to show you something here in the Greek. The Greek and the Greek word or, order is this, kai, the os. Hey, uh, ain, ha, lagos. And, the, and God was the word. That last phrase there. And so when we see this last phrase, and God was the word. Now, a lot of people make hay over that. Well, why does uh, theos not have the definite article? Uh, logos has the definite article, the word. Uh, theos has no article. There's no indefinite article in Greek, no a or an. And so you had to figure that out by context. Well, let's look at that. Uh, first of all, we know that the word is the subject because it has the article. And so and this is from Mounts, William Mounts. Uh, we would translate it accordingly as, uh, and the word was God. So because the, the word or ha lagos has the article, it's the subject of the sentence. The, of course, uh, immediate response would be, the, uh, uh, what about, or why is theos thrown forward in the word order? So why, why does it read, literally, and God, ain ha lagos, if this is the subject, and the word was, and that's modifying God, why does it throw it up there in the front? And it sounds like uh, Yoda. Well, also, why does God lack the definite article? Why is it the God? Well, there's some good explanations. This is where it gets really cool uh, to me. Basically, uh, William Mount says it, this, that the... Uh, the theos in being in the front is in the emphatic position, which stresses its essence or quality. One translation says, what God was, the word was. Well, I like what Lang says. Go ahead. Well, in, in the Greek, that, that's not the way it works for in the Greek, though. It's a little different in the English. We would want the God in the English. But in the Greek, uh, uh, you will see personal names with the sometimes. It just depends on how the, the construction is to give you the idea that, um, like, for instance, the logos there, because it's the subject, carries a definite article. The definite article doesn't distinguish that word from all other words. It says, this is the subject of this sentence. Whereas we put the subject at the front to tell us what the subject is, the article, that little ha right there, tells you that's the subject. No, it doesn't matter what the word order is. It's the construction of the word that tells you the subject. And, and so if it didn't have, if it were kai theos, Ain Lagos, you wouldn't know which one was the subject. You'd either be saying, and God was, was word, or word was God. You wouldn't know. But that little article tells you the subject is the word. What we're talking about is the word, and we're going to describe it, 
and we're going to attribute something to it. We're going to uh, predicate something about it. We're going to predicate that it is God. Okay. Uh, Lang uh, uh, points out this. He says, Theos, without the article, signifies divine essence or the generic idea of God in distinction from man and angel. So when it says the word was God, uh, it's, it's, it's not saying um, the word was the Father. It's saying that the word has the essence of God. You get this in verse 14 where, and the word became what? Flesh. And, and so it's the same thing there. It's the essence of flesh, humanness. The word didn't become a man. That's not the point. It didn't, it didn't become, you know, uh, uh, that's why they don't translate it a man. Because it's not about him becoming a, an, an individual man in that verse. It's about him taking on humanness or humanity, flesh, sarks. That's the Greek word. He takes on physicality or, or, or that. So uh, let, let, me, let me see if I can't clarify that a little bit. I know it's a little bit difficult, but. Uh, Lang says the article before Theos would here destroy the distinction of personality and confound the son with the father. Now, um, again, Mount says it lacks its lack of the article keeps us from identifying the person of the word, Jesus Christ, with the person of God, the father. And that becomes important. He says that is to say the word order tells us that Jesus Christ has all the divine attributes that the father has. Lack of the article tells us that Jesus Christ is not the Father. And I'm going to show you all this in just a minute. John's wording here is beautifully compact. It is, in fact, one of the most elegantly terse theological statements one could ever find. As Martin Luther said, the lack of the article is against Sabellianism. The word order is against Arianism. So, let's see what that means. Okay. This is a fictitious uh, version of it. And the Word was the God. That would be what it looked like. And here, it, the Father and the Word, uh, the Word would be the Father. If you said in Greek, kai ha lagos ain ha theos, then it would be, and the Word was the God. And so you would have this radical distinction. But what has John said already before he says this? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Okay, so in the beginning, the Word was God, and the Word is, I mean, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So without anything else, what would you conclude from that right there? There are two different folks. They both have existed for all eternity. In the beginning, before anything created, all that stuff. In the beginning, God created. So in the beginning, the Word was with God, creating, because that's the whole point. He was in the beginning, and all things were created through Him. So you get this idea that there are two persons there in the creation. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then if you said, and the Word was the God... There would be no longer two persons, but just one person. You would, you would wipe out that, that division, that separation. But if you did like this, and you translated it in the word order here. Oh, yeah, ah, okay. And the word order, this thing ain't working. There it is. Kai ha lagos ain theos. See, the word order here is, is, uh, is backwards, and, and that takes the emphasis off of theos, off of God, and takes it out of the emphatic position and makes it a God. You would properly translate that as, the, and the word was a God. That's how the Jehovah's Witnesses translate the, the verse. The New World Translation says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was a God. And so that would be technically true if the word order were that way. But the word order is not that way. And there's only one way that John 1.1 could be written 
to conclude that Jesus is both with God, you know, the Word is both with God and actually is God. And that's the way it's written. With kai theos ein ha lagos. That's the only way you could write the construction to communicate the actual truth of the fact that, that the Word is there, but the Word is not just with God, the Word is also God in essence, but not identical with the Father, that there's still this distinction between the two. It's the only way you get there. Uh, you know, you could get there, you could get to Arianism if you change the word order, and you could get to Sabellianism if you add the article, but the only way you get to Nicene Christianity is that phrase structured that way in that particular text. And, go, and he goes on. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. So that's, that's the point. He is there with God, and he is eternal, and he is the one through whom all things are made, and without him nothing is made. And all things are made through him. Now, verse 4 continues on. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So, I want you to think about that. In him was life. What does that mean? Do, is life in you? Yeah, you might, could say, you might could technically say that life is in you. But I would say, more, more precisely, you probably have life. Life is in you, but you have life. Uh, but you might could use the language life is in you, but uh, you got some more stuff there. Life was light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. But I want you to think about something uh, it, that this next part says, John 5, 26. Jesus says, for as the Father has life in himself. Wait. Now, we're talking about something different here than what we have. God doesn't have life in himself as we have life in ourselves. Uh, we, we need to make a distinction. God has life in himself in that he is life. It's part of his essence, his being. He is the source of life. We possess life. We have it as something that, that you know, we get and it can be taken from us. We can communicate life through you know, uh, 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 reproduction. But even that is something that we are just passing along. Even that can be taken from us, and it can be taken from that which we produce. But God has life in himself in the sense that he is life. It's in him. He, he, he's the source of life. So he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Well, that is interesting. If life in him right there if life is in God, and it's part of who He is, part of His essence, how can He grant the Son to have life in Himself if that language means the same thing, that Jesus has it essentially? Yep, you're talking about humanity and deity. You're asking the same, you know, the question, in His deity He has life in Himself, well, why does God have to grant the Son to have life then? What's God granting? He's granting the incarnation. He's granting the Son to become man and, and as, as God become man. He's granting the incarnation. He is sending Jesus to us for our sake. He's not granting Jesus to be a God. You can't grant someone to be a God. You can't grant someone to have life in themselves in the sense that God has life in himself because he is life. He isn't granting to Jesus to have life or, or to have the essence of life. He already has that. He's granting that the, that the, the, that the word, the son, becomes man and has life in himself. And he gives him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man that's the whole point <clears throat> he's he's not he has life in him just like the father does not like we do okay clear as mud 
Maybe this will make it a little bit clearer. Psalm 36, verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life, with God. The fountain of life. He's the source, right? In your light, we see light. Let's go back to that verse. Oh, wait, maybe this, I think I already had it. Yeah, here it is. John 1, 4 through 5. In him, in Jesus, or in the word, was life, and the life was what? The light of men. Let's go back to that again to Psalm 39, 6, uh, 36, 9. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. You see these connections between Jesus and the language of the, of the apostles and the language of the Old Testament, and they tie it together. They know what they're doing. They're doing that on purpose. They're, they're not making a mistake. They are clearly identifying Jesus with God in the Old Testament in a profound way, not just as God as he's God's agent. And they're going to do this over and over and over and over again to keep driving home the point that Jesus is God in the flesh. In fact, John's whole gospel is geared towards this thing. He says in chapter 20, verse 30, 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And, and what's prominent in the Gospel of John is that Jesus is reenacting all the things that God did. He's going about doing what God did. I mean, he feeds the, the people in the wilderness, you know. He, he's, the bread of, he's the bread come down from heaven. Uh, he even writes with his finger like God wrote with his finger, you know, and he writes in the sand. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, he's doing all these different things that point back to who God is. I mean, that's, that, as far as I know, the only two times that anybody ever wrote with their finger is when God writes on the mountain and when Jesus writes in the sand. So Jesus is God. He is, he is doing this. They, the, the disciples and apostles are doing this, making these connections on purpose to get us to, to see. And I think Jesus is doing it also uh, on purpose to get us to see that he indeed is God. Well, verse 14, John 1, 14 through 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. Was he born first? <laughs> Jesus wasn't born before him. Uh, and, and so he, who, well, he might have been before. He wasn't conceived before him. I don't know what the timeline of the birth was. He who comes after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received the, uh, gra and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He's in the bosom of the Father. Now, there's a, uh, a textual thing here that in a lot of the better manuscripts, it actually reads, the only begotten God, not Son. And you can make a very strong case. You look at the ESV, it says begotten God. Uh, different ones say that. So you can make a very strong case that even John is, is, is using that kind of language here. Uh, you know, of course, it's, it's uh, challenged, uh, but, it is, but it is there. Okay, any questions or comments? We actually got that all through all that. That's... That's almost bad because now I got a lot more prep to do. <laughs> because now we're going to go to the next objection. What's the next objection? Well, they, the apostles, did think that Jesus was God, but that, that they were later and they made it up. Jesus never claimed to be God. And so now, next week, what we're going to look at is did Jesus actually claim to be God? Did he point to himself as God? Uh, you know, or were they just kind of inflating things along the way? All right, any questions? Yeah.
No objections? No comments? Too much? Oh. <laughs> well, it, it gets clearer and clearer as you get into it because when you, and right now all we're trying to show, all I'm trying to show is that there is a clear uh, uh, understanding among the apostles that Jesus is in fact God. But I think there's also a clear understanding among the apostles that he is not the Father. Uh, I think that's clear. We haven't made that case very strongly yet. We're just making the case that Jesus is God. If, if you're only going what we were going on tonight and looking at what we've looked at tonight, you might get confused and say that Jesus is the Father. and You, know, you might could go modalism uh, and say that, that those are just roles that, that, that God plays. You know, he's Father, and then he's Son, then he's Holy Spirit, you know. Um, um, that's Sabellianism. Sabellianism believes that Jesus is the Father. Um, and so that the Father actually died on the cross. And that's considered a heresy. Uh, but what we're going to do is begin to make the case later on that they are one essence but three distinct persons. And we'll see that. They, under, they understood more than you think. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Why do you think he said that? He recognized Jesus as, as God. They didn't have the fullness of it. They didn't understand. Yeah. Uh, you've seen me. Show us the Father. You, you, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. Do you not understand yet? And so, yes, they... they they struggled with it. Don't get me wrong. They, they struggle with it. Oh, James didn't even realize he was anything before him. Oh, yeah, it's after his resurrection. It, de it definitely comes after the resurrection. Yeah. But she also didn't understand. She knew, she understood, but she didn't understand. And, and, Here's, here's something that I just heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I just heard this recently, and that is that there is in the, in the, in the period leading up to this, in the, in the Second Temple period, that there were some people who began to understand God in two persons. I never heard that before. Um, and so there might have even been some theological prep for this idea, that God's preparing them to receive this. Yeah. Yeah, and a couple months later, you throw a third one. Yeah. <laughs> but if you, when you go back and you look at the Old Testament, you see things like you know what you know. The, you talk about the Son. You see that there's a that God has a Son. You begin to make these connections. They were they were starting to make these connections. They were starting to understand. Right, right. You put them together. They might not have understood it, but you put them together, and it's just like us. You, you, you can see uh, uh, the 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 deity of Christ, but but we don't talk about Jesus as the Father. We we pray to God in the name of the Son, but by that we're not denying His deity, but we recognize a distinction within the persons. Properly, Jesus didn't. Jesus said, uh, "In that day, you will pray to the Father in my name." He didn't say pray to me. He said, "Pray to the Father in my name." He says, "I bring you to the Father." So that's the whole point. And the Holy Spirit exalts Jesus. Yeah, he, yeah. All judgment has been given in the hands of the Son. So, but that's speaking of his humanity, by the way. Uh, that's going to be another study one day, how Jesus becomes judge of the earth. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Right, the wrath of the Lamb. 
you know, when the lamb uh, pours out his wrath on the people, how does, how does Jesus end up getting the right to judge as a man? That's what people don't understand. Paul said, told the Athenians that, that, that God would judge the world through one man. So we're on judgment day, we're going to stand before a man. And, 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 you know, why is that? Huh? Well, I mean, if you're standing before God, who's going to stand? <laughs> you know, God isn't touched by our infirmities, and he's not going to, you know, you know, that's what Job was complaining about. You're not touched by what I'm touched by. How can you understand me? And Job never, I, I, I thought Job had figured it out, but he didn't. It was Elihu that figures it out and says, hey, uh, you know, there is a mediator. Uh, and, and so uh, Job is kind of left in this quandary. Who's going to figure who's going to touch God and touch me and bring us together? And that's Christ. And why can he do that? Because he's both God and man. Because he can touch God and understand God and he can touch me and understand me. Only God, a God man can be a mediator between God and man. You know, he can he can understand both. Do what now? Yes. As a man, he is submitting himself to the will of God. His human nature didn't want to go to the cross. He cried vehemently against it, wailed before God. Ah, don't do this to me. <laughs> you know, I don't know how he's. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he, but with vehement cries, and God heard him because he was a son. But he set his face to go anyways, you know. He said, not my will, but your will be done. So in his humanity, he has a will not to experience that. Uh, but he submitted that to God. And, and, and because of that, because of the cross, his, in his humanness, he earns the right to judge. He learned obedience by the things he suffers. Romans 5 and 6 says that, he, uh, uh, that he's able to open the scroll of judgment because he has prevailed, uh, and he prevailed through his death. And then when, when they see him, you know, it's the, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, and they look at him, and it's the lamb, and he pours out his wrath as judge of the earth. So people, that's what I was getting at, that, that we're going to be judged by our peer. You know, that someone who went through it, all excuses are removed, but also there is infinite compassion and mercy if we repent, you know. And so God is able to, to, to help us through, you know, and, bring, and give co compassion to us by becoming man, by taking that on. And it's, and it's you know, we're going to relate to him in that way. He, he's judged, but he's going to be a, a human judge, a man. And then he'll mediate between us and God. That's both God and man. I mean, what else could it be? Think about it like this. If God were to create the world and just let it happen the way it happened, but absolved himself from ever suffering or ever being a part of it, and just stood over it and watched all this happen, he'd be a cruel God indeed, in my opinion. And so those who deny that Jesus is God incarnate, deny, they basically have a God who not only stood over it and watched it and was never touched by it himself, but sent some poor lackey to go deal with it, you know? Yeah, he gets a lot of reward out of it, and he gets exalted, but, but he had to suffer, and in fact... He gets exalted, and God's kind of just sitting over the sidelines, in, my, in, in their view, in, in my opinion. That's what their view does. God has never himself touched by evil. Now, he can't be in his divinity, but he can be if he becomes man, and he can experience it. And so God wouldn't let us go through this suffering without himself suffering in some sense.
Yeah, yeah. It, it, anything that you do with the created persons that, you know, that if you absolve yourself from it, it, it you, you know, what, what uh, in other words, think of it this way. What right do they have or what, not right, what responsibility do they have for this world? They're created too. You can't send an angel to die for somebody else's sins, even if he's never sinned, because he's not responsible for them. But God is responsible for us. He's the one that created us. He's responsible in the sense that a father is responsible for his son breaking a neighbor's window when he's too young, and i got to pay for it. And so God is responsible for the world the way it is, and him to send somebody else to die for our sins is, is him, first of all, you know, shirking his duty. <laughs> Second of all, him never being touched by evil and not being able to, to, to even grasp the meaning of it. Not the meaning of it, but the, 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 he can grasp, he can see it, but he can't feel it, put it that way. He can't feel the impact of it without becoming a man. And, and so, uh, you know, he's not touched, as Job said. He's not touched by, like I'm touched, and, and I'm not touched the way he's touched. And, uh, you know, there has, God has to experience both. And the only way he can do it is to come down in the world, be a part of it. And in so doing, he takes responsibility for all of his children and makes a way for them to be saved. And those who refuse rightly deserve their eternal damnation. They, they rightly deserve it. God did everything that he needed to do to make their way into heaven, to make their path into heaven. And if they reject that, then, then you know, they, it's because they love sin and wickedness and because they exalted themselves. Anyways, it's getting late. We're way late. 30 minutes late. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the evening. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to discuss and to think about these deep things. In Jesus' name, amen.